Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12063. This is Advanced Statutory Interpretation and Drafting. Thank you, Nadine, Nicole, Jessica, for attending in person. Um, if you're undertaking the unit and you haven't joined us for the live session, please consider doing so. Um, when we only have two or three participants, it's a little hard to get some discussions going. Um, it's a bit unfair. But uh, to those that are joining me live, if you have any questions, if you have any contributions, please unmute your microphone or use the chat facility. If you're watching this as a recorded session, please ensure that you um, do make a note of the time when you're watching the session as you'll need that for your third assessment piece. Um, likewise, um, for anything that you do that's contributing towards the unit, please um, make sure that you keep a record of it. And um, I do invite you and urge you to contribute progressively as we go. Now this week, week six, we're dealing with the principles and practice of plain English. And I'm going to show you a website, a resource that you might find useful. So to do that, I'll share the screen and hopefully identify the correct page. What you should see there, um, to the right, some commentary in relation to English synonyms and antonyms by James Champlin Fernald. Hopefully that's correct. And on the left-hand side of the page, you should see something in relation to the um, other material. Now, is that correct? Is that what you're seeing on your screen? It's just not coming up as clearly on my screen as I'd like. All right, thank you. So um, the facility that I'm mentioning is um, a free book. It's through Project Gutenberg, and you'll see there at the top, it offers 60,111 free eBooks to download. And you may donate, it's a bit like Ostley. So on the left-hand side of the page, you'll see an extract from what I've downloaded as an EPUB um, image. And you'll see that for the word abridgment, there are a number of synonyms with some statements of explanation. And um, it will also include um, synonyms and antonyms for other words for um, together with the commentary. So that's a free publication and well worth considering stop the share at this stage. Another um, publication that you might want to consider as a resource um, is in relation to the resources of Crown Law. And again, to share the screen, you should be seeing some commentary in relation to Crown Law. And um, the resources tab provides some very good information in relation to a number of topics. So the one that I've selected there is statutory construction in administrative law, recent developments, a good resource for you to consider. And you'll see in that particular case, some reinforcement of the importance of careful construction of statutory provisions and familiar reference to Project Blue Sky, etc. Sorry, John. Uh, yes. Yes. I just wanted to, to mention um, statutory construction. We've actually, my firm just actually ran a case in the Plain oh. Environment Court. So yes. it is something that comes up regularly. It was to do with the construction between um, SPA and the Planning Act. Yes. Um, um, and so it, it was about a joinder application, um, but it was amazing how something, you know, that we're looking at this week is actually something that would run uh, for, for a matter. Oh, that's good. Thank you very much for contributing that, um, Nadine. That's, um, sorry, that was Nadine, wasn't it? Who made that comment? Yeah, Thank yes. you. Um, so yes, that's um, really intriguing and um, heartening that some of the information that we're touching on is actually um, useful in practice, as we'd hope it would be. All right, so what do we hope to achieve as a result of considering this week's material 
which is principles and practice of plain English. Um, the first thing is that potentially it's a misnomer. We tend to talk in terms of plain language now rather than plain English because this has become an international type movement. So in the um, aims and ambitions for the unit for, for this week, we mentioned that at the end of the topic, you should be able to scrutinize your own writing and the writing of others to determine whether the writing is sufficiently coherent. Getting to the point as quickly and as comfortably as you can is the aim. You should be able to write in a manner that deals with legal issues comprehensively. Identify the importance of consistency within and between documents, particularly in relation to the meaning of words and the style and tone of writing. We'll give some examples about that tonight and you'll see some good material in the study guides. It's very annoying at best and confusing at worst where there is a change of meaning of words within a document or likewise the style or tone of the writing. So do scrutinize your own writing and again the writing of others to determine whether the writing has sufficient clarity for the intended audience. So to whom you're writing, to whom you're addressing the remarks is also important. And finally, it's a matter of discussing the importance of taking particular care and critically revising work during the process of legal drafting. So as you would have noticed, there's no prescribed textbook reading this week, but I have referred you to a number of articles. Please read those. If you do, make sure that you refer to that in your um, uh, program of the work that you've done for the unit and uh, include that in your um, summary for assessment three. Now I understand that the students that are enrolling in this unit are likely to be proficient in interpretation and drafting because it's an advanced level. Um, and it's also the case that you probably have an interest in the subject matter. So in that sense, many of the things that I say about legal drafting might be teaching to the converted. But there are the five C's which provide if you like the mantras, the basic principles that you need to always consider as part of your legal writing. Number one, your writing should be coherent. Number two, your writing should be comprehensive. Number three, your writing should be consistent. Number four, your writing should be clear. And number five, your writing should be the product of care. So the five C's. So let's just break that down a bit and there's reference to this in your notes. When we talk about coherence, we talk about a quality where the elements of the writing are logically consistent and harmonious. It's very jarring when you read something that is not logically consistent or it does, lacks harmony. It needs to be comprehensive and here's the trade-off between brevity and that which is comprehensive. So in other words, it needs to cover all of the subject matter required to accomplish the piece's purpose. Consistency, it's important that you maintain general characteristics throughout. From a practical perspective, a good way to do that is to use headings. Consistency in format, a real bugbear of mine. Um, and students, uh, I don't like it when students suddenly change for example, font size in the middle of an assessment or fail to use consistent hierarchy of headings. Others use inconsistent formats for referencing, etc., or lack professionalism in the way in which they cite cases or statutes. Now, I know that you're not gonna fall into any of those traps. So again, I'm preaching to the converted, but it must be formatted consistently, professionally, um, from a practical perspective, it's very difficult to move quickly through a document where there's inconsistency, for example, in format, presentation and headings. Level refers to the complexity of language and therefore the level of reading comprehension required in order to understand the writing. Can I just ask, have any of you used the 
option facility for proofing in the Word program, where you go to the far left and um, under file, and eventually get to proofing where you can ultimately see the level of reading comprehension. Has anyone actually done that? It will say to you at the end of the document, here are the, here's the percentage of words that are in the active voice, passive voice. Here's the level to which you've written, which is like school level, year 13, year two, 10 or whatever. Good, so Nicole has. So please, if you watching this as a recorded session, find that facility and use it. If you can't find it, please ask through Q&A and I'm sure that one of us will guide you in the right direction. So I'm glad that you're using that, Nicole, and I hope that you've found it to be a valuable resource, particularly in relation to the active and passive voice issue. Tense, tense locates a verb and therefore a clause or sentence in time, past, present or future, and also in terms of completion of, at that time. Uh, whether, it, whether it's simple, perfect, continuous, or perfect, continuous. Tone refers to the qualities and level of formality inherent in the piece of writing. And it's important that you are consistent in that regard. There's a good example in the study guide in relation to a tone being very formal and then suddenly becoming informal and vice versa, etc. Voice refers to whether a piece of writing is written predominantly in the active or passive voice, and it's important that you are consistent. Now, of course, you all know that I want you to write in the active voice. There are times where it may be appropriate for you to consider writing in the passive voice, but be very careful about mixing the two, particularly in the one paragraph. So this sentence, see, see what you think. The respondent must reply to this letter of offer by 15 January. If the respondent agrees to this offer, the respondent must file a discontinuance motion with the registrar. The respondent must not comment publicly on the terms of this confidential offer. $10,000 will be paid by the respondent to settle this matter. Did you find the last sentence jarring? We're on a nice flow where we're looking for consistency, we've got an active voice and then suddenly the last sentence is passive voice and we lose our way a bit. It suddenly it becomes difficult to read and it's not as coherent with the rest of the paragraph. Inform your reader. Um, as a lawyer, you are a professional communicator. and The task of communication is to form the recipient uh, to inform the recipient as to your message. So, as I mentioned at the start, whilst we talk about plain English, really these days it's more likely to be plain language. Now, there is a risk, of course, in being too brief. To communicate effectively, you need to provide some detail to make it work. Otherwise, the law could simply be reduced to a few words, even less than the Ten Commandments, so to speak. The law could be entirely summarised by saying, be good or be excellent to each other. But that's not really going to get us very far. So when we talk about brevity and efficiency, uh, coherence and use of language, it needs to be tempered by the overriding requirement to communicate that which is required of us. So you can understand the clear distinction um, and interaction here between plain language and statutory interpretation. And you'll see that in a number of cases where the courts have commented on the way in which you might interpret a contract, for example, where the modern approach is now to consider the context, the surrounding circumstances and the purpose. So the purpose of approach to statutory interpretation is really something that's used in a much broader way now when it comes to interpreting contracts and other documents. All right, so um, now Nicole said that the way in which the proofing mechanism uh, operates was something that we taught in order to law. 
and I do touch on that in introduction to law in some sometimes some offerings. So just to recap, go to files in Word, top left hand corner, files, options, proofing. And at the end of it, if you've ticked the right boxes, you'll not only get a spell check, but you'll also get a, a thing called readability statistics. Let's look at an exercise and I've used this in the past, so you may be familiar with it. But I'm going to ask you to now do some reading and be active. So this might take you five minutes or 10 minutes or so. And um, I'll just share the screen because what I want you to do is read something and try to redraft it into less words. Now, um, can, I, can I ask you, Nadine, Nicole, Jessica, if you care to, um, to, to do this exercise, um, I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but we might just give it five minutes or so. Is that all right? Thank you. All right, so hopefully you can read that. And if I could now ask you to look at reducing that to 100 words. If you're watching this as a recorded session, please pause and do so as well. I'll remain quiet for a while.
How are we traveling? Almost done. All right. I might stop the share now. I hope that's not interrupting too quickly. Actually, no, I won't. What I'll do is um, I'll just move on to invite you to um, provide some thoughts. So I will stop the share. Okay, now, if, sorry to put you on the spot, but does anyone want to offer any suggestions as to how that document, which was poorly drafted, might be drafted more effectively? First paragraph, for example. Any thoughts? Okay, so Nicole said only the first two paragraphs. Yes, which is fair enough. I didn't give you very much time. So Nicole's contribution is this. All actively enrolled CQU students, I like that because it's active voice, studying any mode of study, good, will be subject to ethical standards of the university, including standards of plagiarism and ethical and general behaviour. Very good, very efficient. Um, I like it. Any other thoughts? Nadine, Jessica, anything you wish to contribute? You don't have to. But if you've done some work, let us know. So thank you, Nicole. Paragraph two says, Nicole, any student who does not adhere to the above standards may be subject to disciplinary action at the discretion of the vice chancellor or their representative who may also investigate the matter by obtaining statements from the students involved. Excellent, very good. Nice and coherent, reads very well, very clear use of um, uh, clear language, short sentences. Well, not particularly short, but it reads as if they're short. So, which is perfect. A multitude of short sentences can be very jarring. So thank you, Nicole, that's excellent. Jessica and Nadine, before I offer my suggestions. And Jessica's got one, thank you, Jessica. All students enrolled in this university are at all times subject to the ethical standards imposed by the university through legislation, custom and practice, whether the course being studied is online or face to face. Excellent, very good. Again, very different to what Nicole had put, but very good, equally as good. So thank you very much. All right, so anything further, Jessica, or anything from you, Nadine? No problem if there isn't. What I had suggested was this. Jessica said I didn't get through it. That's fine. I didn't give you enough time. So um, as a guide, I said, while enrolled at this tertiary establishment, every student is subject to prescribed ethical standards imposed by the university. The vice chancellor may initiate disciplinary action against the student for failing to meet the ethical standards. A disciplinary committee will hear evidence in relation to the matter. The committee will notify the student in writing of the day and time of the hearing. The committee will investigate the matter comprehensively and hear the matter fairly, governed by principles of natural justice. The student has a right to seek legal advice. A student may appeal an adverse decision. So again, mine's not necessarily the best answer, but in my response, as you have done, we attempt to write in a consistent manner, active voice and um, a natural sort of flow. Putting it into practice is somewhat difficult and requires practice, but there's a little textbook that I've got, which I will now refer to. Um, it's Clear and Precise Writing Skills for Today's Lawyers by MacDonald and Clark Dixon, 
This happens to be the third edition. At page 112, which is chapter nine, there's a, a part that says putting it all into practice. And essentially the authors say that when you're looking to redraft a document, there's a five step process for doing so. So I'll just run you through these five steps. Number one, separate out the statements. So again, they've given an example of a long flowing commentary and they've identified what are the appropriate statements. Once you've done that and you've broken it down effectively into dot points and um, bite-sized pieces, the second thing to do is to group the statements. So a good way of doing that is this. If when you separate out the statements, you notice that there are 10 statements that you've extracted and three of them start with the words, say a director or let's say a student, then logically those three would form part of a group and you'd move them around to suit. So it may be a student, one, two, three. Um, and then other groups that logically make sense. So that's step two. Step three is remove the traditional language and replace with plain language. So for example, um, shall be avoided, will be canceled. Um, place of profit, replace with employment, things of that nature. So simplify the language and use plain language. Step four, check to see if you can shorten the clause by giving a definition for a group of words used a number of times in the clause. So in the example that they gave, um, arrangement could be defined as meaning contract and arrangement. Step five, format and finalise the redrafted document um, and using numbering and subheadings, etc. So they're the five steps that have been suggested by MacDonald and Clark Dixon. Obviously, there is the opportunity to use proofreading skills um, or, or mechanisms through the Word program and also consider using Microsoft Translator or Google Translate if um, you want to have something that you've written read to you, because when it's read to you, you'll pick up on things in a different way than if you're trying to read it yourself. And I hope that makes sense. All right, um, and you can copy and paste into Microsoft Translator or Google Translate for that purpose. Now I mentioned before the opportunity to do some proofreading and I'll share the screen just to demonstrate this. Um, now, Nicole knows how to do this, so I'm sorry I'm repeating something, but it's pretty simple. And see if I can find the right page. I think this is it. Right, so on the page now you'll see a long winded commentary. I won't ask you to redraft this, but I will show you this. So we go to file, options, proofing, and you'll see that you've got tick boxes where you can customize the way in which you go about proofing. And you can ask for the program to recheck the document. What I then do is take the material and run it through the spell check. And you'll see that um, the editor has come up with no issues. Now the problem is that I had just done this one as a test run and it's not coming up with the results that I was hoping for, as in it's already done the, the reading statistics, but usually what happens, <laughs> and I should have, shouldn't have done a dry run, um, usually what happens now is it will come up with the percentage of words that were in the passive voice, the active voice, 
and it will come up with the readability statistics. So I do apologize that it hasn't come up with that. I'm not entirely sure why, but it just didn't. It did a moment ago when I was testing it. Oh, there it is. I can see it now. Um, so I've just gone back into the uh, spell check. So you'll see there readability statistics in this particular document. Two thirds of the document is written with passive sentences. So you want to get that down. And the flesh Kincaid grade level is 22.3. That's very high. What it means is that it's, you might look at that and think, well, that's a good thing that I'm writing to a very sophisticated audience, but it's usually the, it's the, usually the opposite that we're looking to achieve. We're trying to provide it to a grade level that most people can understand. And the reading ease score of 12.2 is very high. 50 words per sentence is the average, which is way too high for in general terms. So you'll see that that type of um, tool can be useful and assist you from a, from a technical perspective. get rid of that. Any questions about that or what we've covered so far? All good? All right. Um, in terms of how you read material or people read material, when you're proofreading, you've got a basic problem. And that is that the brain takes over and will gloss over things that you may have missed. I'll give you an example here, specific example, and uh, share the screen. You wouldn't have seen this um, unless it's in the notes. I think it might even be in the notes, but have a look at this and just um, tell me if you can understand what is being written. Hopefully you can see that. I'll just give you a moment to read it. So did you understand what it said? So according to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter what order the word, letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place. The best can be a total mess, but you can still read it without problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. And just to refresh, I've just read that of that gobbledygook. So um, what that means is that there's an inherent problem, isn't it? When you're trying to proofread your own work, the brain is just taking over and it's glossing over these spelling mistakes. So to use something of a guide to assist you in the process of drafting documents and proofreading your material is something that you need to consider and build into your program. Now the um, I'm going to refer you now to some commentary by Turnbull. And this was um, some commentary called Clear Legislative Drafting, New Approaches in Australia. It's from 1991. And in the commentary, there are seven basic principles that are set out. The first is use shorter, better constructed sentences. Number two, Avoid using jargon and unfamiliar words. Number three, use shorter words. Number four, use the positive rather than the negative. Number five, use the active voice rather than the passive voice. Number six, keep related words together. And number seven, use parallel structures. So there's some comments that you might want to consider when you're drafting your material for your assessment work. Now, in the past, I've referred you to the Office of the Parliamentary Council. We'll just have another look at that now. I'll share the screen and
No, sorry, my apologies. I'll just stop that chair. Not sure what's happened there. I'll try it again. Could you could you see the Office of the Parliamentary Council website? For some reason my share screen is just not as clear as it should be this evening. You could, right? Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Nadine. I'll try it again. While I'm doing that, have you all had a good look at this website? It's very important, very useful for your material. So it provides a great deal of draft material that you might need, drafting resources as well as training. And it provides up-to-date versions of laws as well as draft bills, some commentary in relation to interpretation of the law and applying statutory interpretation principles. So the website includes excellent drafting resources. And those drafting resources, drafting manuals, drafting directions, templates, client advisors, legislative handbooks, and plain language. You might want to look at the drafting service, a guide for clients, the drafting manual, the amending forms manual, and the plain English manual. So if you find the drafting services, a guide for clients, then it will provide you with information about drafting material and some excellent resources in that regard. So let's see if we can find it. All right. My apologies. All right. No, I won't. Um, I won't attempt to do that anymore. What I'll do is just give you some guidelines and um, ask if you haven't already done so to search out for these things. So look out for the OPC's Drafting Services, a guide for clients. And you'll see that it's there to assist agencies in instructing the OPC about drafting bills or other documents. Have a look at the heading Drafting Instruments and you'll see a checklist for instructions. And it's useful because it will provide information about what needs to be done and why and some comments in relation to complexity. Some practical hints like using um, plain language, using avoiding specialized terms or technical jargon, if possible, being consistent and avoiding unnecessary detail, uh, de unnecessary detail or complexity. It will also provide some commentary in relation to practical things like commencement, whether the document binds the crown complies with obligations from an international perspective and provides for powers to make instruments and delegation. So that's something to consider. Um, it'll also provide you with some commentary about choosing the best drafting techniques, plain English drafting, and have a look at paragraph 136 in that regard. Paragraph 139 indicates very clearly that the um, common laws OPC is keen to replace old fashioned language, complex sentence structures, legalese and jargon, and to replace all of that with modern idiomatic language. Um, they recognise the need to take care in abandoning legal language, which has been the subject of judicial consideration, but where possible, keep it simple. You'll also see some guidelines at paragraph 141, techniques to help readers understand legislation, simplified outlines, 
object provisions, notes, examples, and tables. So from the perspective of assisting you in your assessment work, I would urge you to follow the guidelines as set up by the OPC. So if the OPC says in an ideal piece of legislation, we'll include notes to explain the purpose, the origin, and the operation of a provision, or refer to the reader to related provisions or definitions of terms, then I would urge you to do so as well. There's also commentary in relation to commencement provisions and see drafting direction 1.3 in relation to standardised commencement provisions. You'll see them in a table form and it's intended that they make it easier for you to read through the material. Now I will finish early tonight, so we're just about done and um, I'll urge you to look for these documents during the next week and we'll continue the discussion at that stage. But uh, finally, just in relation to explanatory memorandums, which are common author and explanatory notes, or which are state, there are explanatory memorandums for each bill and each statement for legislative instruments. And to have a look at the legislation handbook, common author in that regard. So that's one basic document to look at. The other, which is where we'll pick up next week, is the common author OPC drafting manual. And it deals with things like naming conventions and gender, gender neutral language. What are the preferred ways to draft material in that regard? Have a look at the Commonwealth OPC amending forms manual, as I mentioned earlier, and look at uh, the fourth one is the OPC plain English manual. So we'll invite you to look at each of those and we'll pick up next week. So before I wrap up on an early, early finish tonight, are there any questions, comments? All good? All right. Thank you very much for participating and particularly doing that redrafting exercise. Keep up with your reading and we'll see you this time next week. All the best. Bye then.